back up the field. It is not pass interference, apparently, against Texas A&M. Indicated personal foul somewhere here. Now, if it's not all set fouls, I think that's what it is. Uh, then we're in trouble with uh, the college rules. Offsetting penalties. Personal foul and pass interference. So they bring it back. I did not see the other flag. Did you? No. <laughs> They'll mark it now back at the 35 yard line. Where it will be second down for Michigan. They've got to go to the Aggie 13 for the first down. So they need 22 on second down. Dickey will put it up. Wants to screen it. Gets it to Smith. And, uh, well, he ran out of the arms of one Aggie. Kevin Monk couldn't hold him. And he made a little bit on the play, but not all that much, as Jimmy Hamilton came up to make the tackle along with Steve Spitzenberger. And the Michigan reserves now are beginning to play. Zara is in the lineup. On fourth down, we're going to get a punting team on the field. Should be John Anderson coming out to do the kicking. He'll hit it into the wind. Keith, in defense of the Aggies, they had to get high up, uh, and up to Texas Tech last week. It was a big conference game. It's tough to play two weeks in a row and have to be up for a Michigan team in Ann Arbor and 104,000 people. Anderson hits a good one, and it's in the end zone. So Texas A&M, with six minutes and 22 seconds to play in a ball game, will get the football at their own 21st down. They are trailing 34-3. The time remaining, 6:22 in the fourth quarter in the ball game, and Michigan exploding, leading seven to three, and lucky to be leading at halftime. Have come out here and just blown it wide open. Aggies have it first down at the 20. Mike Mosley, the quarterback, gives it to Curtis Dickey, and Mike Hart comes up out of the secondary to get him up around the 25-yard line. Michigan just laying back. I think one of the surprises to me, Keith, is that Michigan could uh, hold Woodard as good as they did with their linebackers playing very deep and uh, scraping off to the outside and reading the play and trying to help at the corner. Second down, just beyond the 25. And it's David Brothers going in over the right side, slanting. He's short of the first down, up to about the 28-yard line. A lot of Michigan uh, defensive reserves getting to play now. David Walker shaking on the play, has not returned. Mike Mosley doing the quarterbacking. George Woodard with 113, 138 yards on 33 carries. I'm really surprised that they couldn't get the ball more to Dickey outside. That's been their key in the first ball games. 9-3 in the 100. Woodard for the first down. George out to the 32. So he picked up three, and that'll get him over 140 to 141 yards in the ball game. I can hear the collision up here. Oh. Yes, sir. Well, it takes two or three to good finish it. Well, I guess those, uh, the Michigan faithful around the country who might have been wondering uh, where their offense had gone. They found it today. 32-yard line, first down Aggies. Time call. Mosley looking around, wants time. He'll go to the sideline to talk. 5-16 to play in a ball game. And the game gone for the Aggies. Michigan 34, A&M 3. Looking down on Michigan Stadium from the Goodyear Blimp America. 104,802, third largest crowd watching today, and they, they've been rewarded by the home team as the Michigan Wolverines lead Texas A&M 34 to three. Texas A&M trying to get something going. They bring it up now on third down and about seven to go from just outside the 35, and here's Bill Fleming. All right, Keith, and it's time to announce uh, our Chevrolet offensive and defensive players of the game, Russell Davis, Michigan fullback who scored a couple of touchdowns, Ron Simpkins, a sophomore from Detroit who had 10 tackles today, the defensive player of the game, and in their names, Chevrolet will award a $1,000 scholarship each to the University of Michigan General Scholarship Fund. Congratulations, gentlemen. Mosley to throw it to the sidelines. The pass is intercepted. Picked off by Mike Jolly. He may go. 
Touchdown! The seventh turnover by Texas A&M, and right now it could be the worst defeat ever suffered by an Emory Ballard team since he took over as head coach at Texas A&M. Perfect. Obviously. But he laid back and the pass was thrown across the field in the flat. He came up and jumped and leaped and caught it. Turned it on towards the goal line. Greg Wilner for the point. It's good. At 347 to go in the ball game. It is now Michigan 41. Texas A&M three. And the sky has fallen on the Aggies. Mosley is a freshman quarterback. He throws all the way across the field on an out pattern. Johnny comes up, times it beautifully right in front of him and turns it all down the sideline, cutting back, gets the grain and goes in. From 50 yards for the touchdown. From another angle, you can see him backing up with deep responsibility. When the receiver breaks out short, he breaks up with him. The ball is thrown just outside. He catches it perfectly played. Down the mound, Mike Jolly. Michigan's defensive secondary have been outstanding in this ball game. And it's now 41 to 3 as Wilner prepares to kick off to Smith and Dickey. When you score a lot of points, your defense has played a great game. If you shut another team out, your offense has played a great game. I figure that one out. But that's the way we play. Well, after that, it means uh, if you shut them out, your, your team kept the ball all afternoon. That's correct. You didn't give the turnovers. Kicked out of bounds. It'll cost Michigan five. Well, the Wolverines have had trouble kicking off today. Four. 40 in possession, and I mean in penalties, 4 for 40 against 11 for 102 for Michigan. While we were away, as you look down on Pax Michigan Stadium, Michigan kicked off to the Aggies. Curtis Dickey brought it back to the 31-yard line, where it's first down, Texas A&M. Michigan kicking out of bounds three times today. They have 102 yards in total penalties. And the Aggies now send Woodard up the middle. George headed for 100 and... Uh, 50 yards in rushing today, the way he's going along with it. Got 143 now on 35 carries. He will be sore and bruised tonight and disappointed. And disappointed. Coming up on three minutes to go in a ball game. Mostly reserves on the field now for Michigan. Getting some game experience. As Mike Mosley goes down the line, pitches it out to David Brothers, and the Brothers is run out of bounds. And we'd like to welcome those in the southeast who've been watching Auburn and Ole Miss play football this afternoon down there. Welcome to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where Michigan is whipping Texas A&M 41 to 3 with 3.06 to play in the ball game. It was 7 to 3 at halftime, and Michigan kind of lucky to be in the lead at halftime, but it has been all Michigan in the second half. Seven turnovers by Texas A&M in the game, and the scores you saw lopsided 41-3. They hand it off inside again as Adger Armstrong, number 40, is in there. And coming up on ABC's Wide World of Sports today, the final American appearance and competition of the Great Pele from the Meadowlands in New Jersey. An exhibition game between the New York Cosmos and Santos of Brazil. Two teams that Pele has played with in his brilliant soccer career. At the 40-yard line, it is fourth and one, and the Aggies will go for it. George Woodard fights and gets it as he battles his way out to about the 42, and we go inside two and a half minutes to play in the game. They give him Mosley some experience. Let him run the option play. They can't, do, they can't pull the game out. Our research today by Jerry Klein, our statistician Mike Swanson, two and a quarter to go in the ball game. The Aggies have just been totally dominated by the Wolverines in the second half. Adger Armstrong carries over the left side on first down from the 43-yard line. And he got about six or seven yards as he punched up to the 48. And you see time running as we come up on two minutes to play. But the score is startling. 
Tony Franklin, expected to be such a major factor in this contest, has had no chance. The Aggies have not crossed midfield this half. They haven't come close yeah, until well, now. Aggie. Brothers gets it over midfield, down into around the Michigan 47-yard line where Michael Hart runs him out. Some of the people in the ball game for Michigan, Dale Kites is in. Tom Melita playing up in front at middle guard. Gary Weber is in at a tackle position. Mark DeSantis, Mel Owens, Jeff Bednarik, Tom Seifrin, Mike Jolly, Michael Harden, Gene Bell, and Mark Bremen in the lineup. Virtually all reserves in their play now for Michigan. What? What's this? Mosley hands inside and a little bit of a collision between the fullback Woodard and the quarterback Mosley as on third down and inches to go. He gave it a big George and George popped through there and got a yard. That's about all he needed. And now he's got 151 yards in the ball game on 38 carries. He's had a full day. None of those have been long either, Frank. I think the longest run he's had probably was 11, 12 yards. I would say a minimum of three people have tackled him on each of those plays. That's right. 125 to go in a ball game, and again they pop it up the middle. Prudential College School Board coming along. Yeah, we're anticipating we'll have time to run down some of the scores from around the country with highlights just as soon as the ball game is over. And just prior to the beginning of ABC's Wide World of Sports today, now 155 yards for George Woodard on 39 carries as he, he picked up four yards there. Also, we're getting uh, another segment of our ABC College football audience joining us who've been watching the East Carolina game today. Here's Mike Mosley, the freshman, trying to get it outside. He gives it to David Brothers. Poor David had no place to go by the time he got the ball. Now, that's a play that is... A&M's run several times today, and uh, it seems most of the time it's gone to the tight side of the field. They were actually trying to pass, and the receiver was covered, so it turns into an option play, and uh, there was no place to run. You have to have field to throw there. The football now is sitting at the 49, just over midfield, actually, short of the 49-yard line, with 48 seconds to play and a 41-3 score, Michigan. 41 to 3. Who would have thought it? Adger Armstrong got no place to go as the Wolverines jump all over him on third down and 13. And the clock continues to roll along. So the Michigan Wolverines, who were voted in the first place of the preseason polls, who held first place in the first two weeks of the season, dropped down to third in the nas national rankings last week behind uh, USC and Oklahoma. They come out of the second half today, breathing fire, and they blow the Aggies up. Deliver me from having to play a team that just been moved out of first place. Yeah, Frank Rose made that point very early that uh, the psychological advantage, if there is one, would have to belong to Michigan playing here before the third largest crowd ever, 104,802. And the crowd beginning to come out on the field as Michigan goes across to congratulate the Texas Aggies for the game effort they gave them. The game is over. Michigan has won it by a score of 41 to 3. Provided by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Travel arrangements made through and promotional fee paid by United Airlines. United built the largest airline in the free world around you. Once again, the final score. Michigan 41, Texas A&M 3, a presentation of ABC Sports recognition. Starsky and Hutch. Love. We're going to uh, replay for you now the tape of the actual takeoff. Here you see uh, the two craft poised, ready to go. The 747, piloted by Fitzhugh Fulton and Tom McMurtry, begins to roll. Now, they've done this many times before, but always, of course, with the tail cone attached to the Enterprise. The takeoff was uneventful, although the uh, pilot, uh, Fitzhugh Fulton, uh, reported that uh, there was some uh, moderate to light buffeting during the initial climb. As soon as they were airborne, they began tests to determine just how much the joint planes would be uh, buffeted without the tail cone. Actually, the stability of the 747 is reduced by some 50 percent, and the the expectation was that they would receive three times the amount of buffeting as uh, with the tail cone. Apparently, however, now they are satisfied and uh, they intend to go ahead with the uh, mission as planned. Jules Bergman is out at the uh, landing site some seven miles from my location. Jules, we've got uh, oh, about ten minutes or so to go and they have really run into some uh, rather uh, 
heavy turbulence, haven't they? Or buffeting, as they call it. Frank, you can't see the buffeting. You feel it inside the aircraft, and Joe Engel and Dick Truly inside the orbiter feel it. It's a bouncing sensation to your inside, rather than the drink you suggested earlier. They Well, they might want a drink, but a drink of Dramamine rather than alcohol. <laughs> uh, and as you can see, they're still climbing up. They are climbing up because of the buffeting more slowly than they were scheduled to. They're now at 204 knots, we've last heard from uh, Fitz Fulton, the pilot of NASA 905, which is the 747, a converted airliner. And as you can see, we're 10 minutes and 20 seconds away from separation. So there's no reason to think this won't happen, Frank. It's just been delayed about eight or nine, or about 10 minutes, actually. Back to you. Okay, Jules, thank you very much. It's going to be a spectacular sight when it comes down. We'll be able to follow it down, too, you know, because of uh, the uh, NASA search planes and the chase planes that are uh, just out of sight there. This uh, picture is actually being taken from uh, one of the uh, T-38s that's uh, hovering very close to the uh, two joint aircraft. This is the fourth free flight of the uh, space plane. One more is scheduled on October 27th, which is uh, just two weeks from now. Now, next March, the Enterprise will be taken by the 747, just as you see it here, to the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, for more tests on the ground. Then in August of 1978, the space plane that is due to make the first actual trip into orbit, and by the way, that uh, aircraft is still under construction out here, it will be delivered to Cape Canaveral, and present plans call for the first liftoff into space sometime between March and June of 1979, and then we'll really be in the space shuttle business. The two men who are now flying today's mission, Dick Truly and Joe Engel, have given us a preview of some very, very ambitious projects in the future. We'll take off uh, from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It'll be powered into uh, orbit by two large solid rocket motors and also by uh, some liquid propellant engines in the tail of the uh, orbiter itself. At about 125,000 feet, the solid rocket motors will have done their job, and they'll be uh, separated from the orbiter itself and will be recovered uh, using large parachutes for future use. Uh, from there on into orbit, the orbiter engines will power the vehicle into orbit, and then it will, and then when, which is what I think will be the exciting portion of the orbiter missions, it will do its job, and its job may be any one of a number of uh, missions. It'll change from mission to mission. It may deliver spacecraft into orbit. It may retrieve uh, spacecraft for some reason that need to be retrieved and repaired. And then again, another, what I think is exciting portion of the shuttle mission that we've never done before, and that is after the landing, the same vehicle will be uh, checked out again, refurbished, taken back to the pad, and the same vehicle will go again to make another mission, and again and again. And therein lies the economy of this shuttle as compared to our previous endeavors in space. The unique advantage of the space shuttle itself is that it's going to make it, it's going to make space accessible, and it's going to make it economically possible for a lot more people to use that tool of space. We're using it now for a lot of things, uh, uh, communications and weather forecasting, and, reconnaissance and uh, we're getting into the area of earth resources where we're looking back at the earth and being able to determine uh, where mineral resources are and where fish are uh, schools of fish are uh, in, in the oceans and uh, monitoring pollution monitoring watershed uh, agricultural uses of, of earth resources are, are just now beginning to really start being used and this is with still with the, the very expensive methods of getting to and getting from space um, I think that when you make a tool as potentially useful and exciting as a space platform available to, to more and more people, then the number of uses is going to expand astronomically. You got that right well, here. there you are. We're about uh, seven minutes away from separation now, and the two aircraft still flying very smoothly along there. At least it appears smooth to us, but we can't really uh, relate to the uh, buffeting that uh, perhaps they feel as they climb to the altitude of approximately 22,000 feet where they'll push over and come down to 18,000 feet very fast 
And at that point, the separation will take place. This is a very big week in space, you know. Uh, there was the Soviet flight that, unfortunately, did uh, not turn out quite the way the uh, people there had planned it. But nevertheless, the cosmonauts returned to Earth safely, and uh, that's reason for gratitude. And then, of course, there's this uh, shuttle mission this week here, uh, taking place right now at Edwards Air Force Base. I might say it's also a very big week in sports. A friend of mine might say that uh, tonight the Los Angeles Dodgers may attempt to resuscitate their gladiatorial combatant spirits in another confrontation with the New York Yankees. That's what a friend of mine might say. Anyway, the World Series will be on ABC tonight at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, and I think now we'll get back to the space business and uh, go out to Jules Bergman at the landing site. Jules, it uh, looks pretty good, doesn't it? Frank, everything's going fine as of now. The picture we've been seeing are the mother plane, 747, and the orbiter piggyback riding atop it, some 25 miles north of here, approaching 24,000 feet. The point at which the 747 will push over to pick up speed, and then the separation procedure begins in five or six minutes. Uh, everything is going fine. A few points I want to make. The reusability point you heard uh, Engel and Truly speak about before with the orbiter, that is the clue. Instead of throwing this vehicle away the way they've done with rockets for years, this is aimed to be reused up to 100 times. And the modification to the 747, they've added these two extra horizontal sta vertical stabilizers to give the airplane more stability. You know, Jules, we might point out that the uh, tail cone that we've been talking about so much this morning is uh, by no means a piece of uh, now useless equipment. It will be used, of course, when they actually ferry the uh, space shuttle to, uh, to Canaveral. They'll use it again, I suppose, when they ferry it to uh, Huntsville. To, right, uh, but it's not, it's not intended in space flight, right? No, not in space flight. But uh, since they're going to continue building space uh, planes, in this part of the country, and at least in the beginning of the shuttle program, launching them from uh, Cape Canaveral. They've got to get them there some way, and this is the way they will go. It the really voice, is a carrier plane. The voice we're hearing in the background, by the way, is one of NASA's uh, controllers in Houston, Charles Redmond. Let's see what they've got. Second and last roll to the left. The crew will be deploying speed brakes on the orbiter to slow the airspeed of the orbiter down. That will set them on the final heading for the landing. We are two minutes to push over. We'll update it. Push over minus one. We are inside two minutes to push over. Okay, okay and the pitch is starting to trim down. Okay, real good. Well, we're getting pretty close now. Some Only two a couple minutes, of minutes right? away, yes. Two minutes to a <clears> separation <throat> and about uh, two minutes to push over. And, about 30 seconds longer, actually one minute after that, to push over. I separate these numbers. I've studied them often enough. Uh, and then what you'll see is that very steep descent we've talked about. Uh, coming down the pike, I watched them practicing it here yesterday in a Grumman Gulfstream II business jet, and it's really impressive. They come down at a very, very steep angle. One minute to push over. Well, it's almost like a dive bomber's attack. Uh, yes, they come exactly. swooping down, except that they uh, flare out a little bit. The only. Uh, Thanks for the ride. That was a real smooth one. We're getting some conversation now. Let's right. see if we can't pick it up. And all of a sudden, they stop talking. Well, oh, that's all right. The only aircraft, by the way, that presently do that kind of swift descent are, in fact, uh, attack bombers, uh, dive bombers, as you said, and attack bombers, an occasional fighter in a maximum penetration maneuver. Uh, One thing more, I'd like to just make a point while we're waiting here, Jules, for it actually to happen. It'd be a good idea to keep in mind that this is a free fall. I mean, uh, there are no engines that are functioning on the space plane, and uh, there is no possibility to go back up and come in for another approach. Let's listen to the conversation now. Stand by for pushover. Mark, pushover. There you see the 747 nose. Enterprise has two lights. We're go for sep. And it's a go for separation. Roger, Enterprise. Houston is go for sep. Go for sep. And that's a long shot from one of the chase planes. They've got the good word now to go. Right. The 747 doesn't push over that extreme much. It looks like about 6 or 10 degrees down. But watch and see what happens after they separate. You will be surprised. 
Well, I hope not, Jules. Not ready. No, you'll be surprised <laughs> by the steep <laughs> angle. Favorably, I hope. Oh, yeah. There it is. Nice. Stay clear. You are go for 203. Enterprise, you are go for 203. Well, they get far apart in a hurry, don't they? Well, now he's on his own. Less than two and a half minutes from now should be touchdown. If it isn't, there'll be a lot of questions I asked and a lot of answers that <clears throat> can't be answered. Well, the previous uh, free flights have lasted about five and a half minutes. Right. With this high rate of descent, uh, everything happens more than twice as fast. And the picture we're seeing is uh, 20 miles due north of uh, our desert lake bed right, camera site high, here. A little high. And what you hear is mission control in an elaborate engineering setup telling the pilots of the Enterprise you're a little high, as they just did, which means duck nose down. down. Look, look at this, Jules. Enterprise, you're about 1,000 feet high. It's made 1,000 feet high this time. Yeah. Now, there we're beginning to get an angle of descent. That's no 10 or 11 degrees, I'd say. And don't be misguided by this shot, which is shot from a chase plane forward and under the Enterprise. There it is. 1,500 feet high. Yeah. high. Now, watch them dive to get off that altitude. Speed brakes coming to 50. My God, here they come right at us. What an angle oh, of descent. Yes. Holy mackerel. It's like a, almost like a oh, rock falling. Yes. Look You're at the on the glide slope. We see you on the glide slope. That's some glide slope to be on. So far, so good. Brakes closing. Speed brakes out. <clears throat> Time for the gear. Gear's coming. There he is. You see Gentlemen. the gear coming? Gear's down. Feet. Moving at over 250 20 miles feet. an hour. 10 feet. 5 feet. Easy. 4 feet. 2 feet. Easy. 1 foot. Down. <laughs> and a beauty. Coming down. 2 feet. 1 and foot. And a beauty. Down. <clears throat> Both main gear down perfectly. From all events, a safe landing. They got a lot of room to roll now, too, out here. <laughs> well, that plume of dust you're seeing, uh, he is trying braking. The engine noise you're hearing, of course, is not from him. It's from the four T-38 chase planes. And well, this one was different. This one was different, indeed, from the other flights. You could see that steep angle, couldn't yeah. you? Okay, it was about stopped. two minutes and 35 seconds or so from separation to Mark. actual touchdown. And they came down from, uh, what, was it 18,000 joules? Approximately 18,000. Uh, my guess is 18,200. I never heard the actual number. And it appears that they're stopped at the uh, end of this desert lake bed, runway 17. They didn't take very long to, uh, to roll out either. That's because this time, too, they were uh, applying the brakes. Well, there it is. It's parked, and there's the 747 which will be coming down very shortly, too. Performed its uh, mission once again very well. Well, we'll be back in a moment to continue with our live coverage of today's events here at Edwards Air Force Base. First, this message. And they're down safely. I can see them stop down here at the end of this lake bed runway. The Russians, as you mentioned earlier, had a mishap earlier this week when their Soyuz 25 went up to dock with their Salyut 6 space station and didn't do it. The Russians said we got within 100 meters or 300 feet, but they never said whether they, on the, whether they were on the same plane or what the closing speed was. And classically, in at least four Soyuz flights, the Russians have not been able to dock. They do it automatically. We do it manually. The question is, will they be able to resolve all their problems? They had planned a big space spectacular, 
to celebrate the Bolshevik Revolution. Okay, Jules, thank you very much. We'll be back in just a moment with more on today's flight of the spaceship Enterprise after this brief message. Robert, a demonstration of football fever prior to homecoming game tomorrow. Channel 7's Rick Evans was there, and he's here now with the story of the maize and blue. Rick? The maize and blue, indeed. Pep rallies are supposed to be a tradition during homecoming, but in the late 60s and early 70s, they died out at Michigan. Well, now they are back, and maybe louder than ever. The credit for the rebirth of the pep rally belongs to the guys in the Sigma Chi fraternity. They've sponsored it for four years. Attendance has picked up each year, and tonight there were roughly 700 there to hear the coach and a captain promise a victory. Our job tomorrow is to regain the pride and prestige of Michigan football, and we intend to do that at the expense of Iowa. Last week we went up to Minnesota and we didn't do real well. We didn't we didn't have a support like this. And um, I know we're gonna win tomorrow. And, um, I know one thing, I'm not predicting a win or a loss, but I tell you one thing, we're gonna go after their ass, and I know I hope everybody's there to watch. But the final word belonged to radio announcer Bob Eufer. His mile a minute speech ended up like this. Who's the number one football team in the country right now? Michigan! Oh. Michigan! All right, that Michigan team is over there in the campus in right now, and they're listening to us. Let's show them how we're going to support them over the next four Saturday afternoons by singing one stanza of the greatest college fight song I've ever written, the Michigan Lakers had a joy. Well, it was a fun evening in Ann Arbor and only the start of homecoming activities. After all of that noise and all of that enthusiasm, the only thing that I have left to say is go blue. Phil? Good is Martians approach. Sunday night, WDRQ-FM will rebroadcast War of the Worlds. And tonight, Ron Sanders chatted with Jock Don Riley about that memorable pro program. Originally, it was broadcast like on Halloween Eve, and it's kind of a tradition in radio right now. When it was originally broadcast, there were, of course, a lot of people who committed suicide and did other strange things that, that others attributed to the War of the Worlds. How, how are you going to avoid that kind of thing? Well, at that time, radio there was no television. And radio was the word. And it was, you know, <laughs> just the gospel truth. Whatever you heard on radio, you believed. <laughs> It is fortunate times have changed so mass panic doesn't strike like it did when War of the Worlds first aired. But perhaps it is unfortunate, too, that we no longer need to call upon our imagination to continue painting those brushstrokes that radio began. Kids, I think, again, today are listening, though, to radio-type drama. There are all kinds of records on sale now. Batman and that kind yeah. of thing. I love kids, the radio Kids drama. really like to listen to it, yeah. They, they prefer it sometimes to television. Let's just look back over the season that we just went through with the Michigan team and and okay. get your thoughts on it. Okay, good. Well, we opened with Illinois, as you know, and uh, Gary Moeller, uh, one of our old assistants there, and a, and a great coach. And here's Leach passing to Clayton for a touchdown. And this game was kind of one we didn't know exactly what to expect. You're talking about a team with a new coach, and Gary closed all his practices in the spring practice. We didn't know what to expect, uh, particularly offensively. We knew what he'd do defensively, but fortunately, we won 37 to nine. And, and uh, that kind of set the stage for the season. Then it's back home where you play. And to the common good, so, the president gets to make up a lot of his, his own job uh, requirements and performance. So, Jan, do you believe that the resistance movement, the, no matter what,